All right, well, welcome everyone. And um, I think I got 12.01, so we'll take a few minutes here and kind of do introduction in that. And by the time we get started up, I think the majority of people that are registered should be able to get on by that point. Um, welcome to our second installment of 2024 of Agricultural Land Management Quarterly. We have um, myself, Jim Jansen. I'm an ag economist here at the University of Nebraska. Our website where a lot of my publications go up on is listed below my contact information. And Anastasia, would you like to say a few words before we get started? Yeah. Hello, I'm Anastasia Meyer. Um, I am the other Eastern economist um, for Nebraska Extension. I serve mainly the Southeast area. Um, my contact information is there, and um, Jim and I partner a lot on different projects. Yep. Yeah, Anastasia has been with us a little over six months now, and we're excited to have her. If you recall, Alan Benalek used to work on this program, and I think he's fully retired from the University of Nebraska now, so we're really glad to have Anastasia on board, and she's covering uh, some of the similar topics Alan did. So we hope to continue this program on into the future. And if you'd like to get a hold of either of us, those phone numbers are our mobile phone number as well as our email addresses. So please be sure to reach out if you have any questions or concerns. Uh, one thing this year, we're looking for some sponsors for land management quarterly. In other years, we've had different companies reach out to us and uh, we'll feature a slide. You can put it to whatever you'd like on it and we'll feature it twice in the presentation. The uh, sponsorship helps cover some of the expenses associated with putting these webinars on. So if you are interested, by all means, please reach out to myself or uh, Anastasia and we'd be more than happy to uh, help you out with this. So with this, we'll just go ahead and get started with the webinar. Uh, just briefly, the outline of the topics we intend to cover today are listed here for May, Monday, May 20th, 2024. Uh, first part we're gonna be taking a look at is the current state of cash rents in Nebraska and uh, some of the different ch changes we've seen with commodity prices. Uh, Anastasia will be covering the second part on some of the decision making and communication that we have incorporated into this. And then finally, we'll review any questions that get submitted as we're going along. If anyone has any questions, please type them into the question pane and we will go over those as time permits. So the first part, I think many people are interested in the current state of cash rents and where they might be at in 2024. Um, we'll be taking a brief overlook at where the preliminary estimates were in 2024, some of the changes that came with it. So first thing, as everyone knows, the university annually puts out a survey on the topic of land values as well as cash rental rates. Uh, the preliminary estimates were published in the middle of March, and then the final report is published in June. And it has all the preliminary estimates information and provides greater detail the land values and cash rents from both surveys typically stay very similar from year to year. So there may be some minor changes, but overall things tend to stay fairly similar. The best place to find this information, you can either take a look at the real estate website that we have listed here, or you can take a look at, um, in addition to the farm real estate website, you can always take a look at your local extension office, many of them can run off a copy for you or have some additional information beyond what we might have listed here. And Ryan Evans also slipped in the hyperlink to the website here on the webinar. Um, so what we'll do is we'll go over some of the cash rental rates that tend to be some of the more popular rates that we have asked to us. For dry land cropland in 2024, we see the rates that we have are somewhat mixed across Nebraska. About half the state reported just slight decreases. Half of the state's cash rents were just slightly up. These numbers would probably indicate that overall cash rents are maybe steady to slightly mixed. So it really comes down to where you're at. And we'll be highlighting some of the reasons why we might be seeing some of these changes that we're seeing on 
In addition to the average that we had on the prior slide that's denoted with an A, standing for the average, we have what stood uh, the breakout here for 2024 on dryland cropland. We have what is called HAL. HAL stands for the average of the high third, average of the low third, and overall average. The average of the high grade and the low grade are really, or the average of the high grade and the low grade are really the upper third and the lower third of cash rents for the area. So we have the breakout here from the upper third to the lower third, no overall average. Some of the reasons why we see differences in cash rental rates across Nebraska has to do with the rainfall, the type of soil, configuration of the field. So do you have a nice square field or is it a field that has some type of obstruction in it that may limit the ability to farm around something? Uh, all these differences influence the cash rental rates that we see on this slide. And in addition to the dry land cropland, we also report on gravity irrigated as well as center pivot irrigated cropland. Breakdown that we have here for center pivot irrigated cropland, you can see that the, the rates once again vary considerably across the state. These rates assume that the landlord owns the entire irrigation system. That would include the pivot, the pump, and the power unit. If the tenant is providing one of those components, more likely than not, you would discount the cash rent to account for some of those differences. So all the factors or features we've mentioned about dry land cropland influencing cash rental rates are also carrying over to the center pivot or irrigated cash rents. The breakdown that we have here has some indications on how the cash rents vary around by region. And this also represents, once again, the low third the upper third, and the overall average. And if the tenant provides, for example, the power unit or the well, or excuse me, the power unit or the pivot, you would discount the cash rent to reflect that. And what I mean by discounting it, you would reduce the cash rent charge because the tenant is providing a component of the system. And in addition to the dry land and irrigated cropland, we also have the grazing land rates, the preliminary estimates reported on the center pivot, as well as grazing land on a per acre basis. Um, I tend to focus a little bit more on the cow-calf pair rental rates. So an example, for one cow, one calf, for one month during the summer grazing season in Southwest Nebraska, the overall average reported was $60.55 a pair. So an example, if you're gonna be grazing for let's say five months, to adjust for that, we would um, at $65.85 to adjust, or excuse me, at $60.55, we would multiply it by five. So roughly 60 times five is a little over 300 in this case. So that's one way you could adjust the cash rent to account for the fact that the tenant so one, or excuse me, to account for a seasonal grazing rate, not a monthly grazing rate. If you're someone that wants to charge by the day instead of the month or the season, you simply take the seasonal rate and divide it by um, 150, or take the monthly rate, divide it by 30. Those are two different ways to adjust the cash rents. So we briefly covered the current state of cash rents in Nebraska. Next, I'd like to cover uh, some of the differences on why we're seeing some of these trends uh, related to things like weather, but also taking a little bit deeper dive into how do we adjust cash rents to account for some of the declines in commodity prices or some of these other features we have occurring right now. So when I updated these slides from last year, um, I think it was worth taking a look back this. overall in the United States, you know, California usually has various degrees of drought out there, but the South Central Plain states really were getting hit pretty hard by drought. And um, pockets of eastern Nebraska, Kansas overall was very dry. We fast forward to 2024, if you look at the drought monitor, this was the most recent one that was published, You'll note that if this region is denoted without a color or an absence of color in white, that there's no uh, drought currently being logged. 
and the darker the degree of the colors, the more greater severity of the drought. So we see this breakout here for Nebraska. And uh, once again, for 23, almost the entire state was in some degree of drought. Some areas not quite as bad as others, but it was a very dry period of time. And we fast forward to 2024 right now. Yes, there are areas that are abnormally dry or experiencing some degree of moderate drought. In fact, kind of in the Omaha, Lincoln, uh, maybe in the Grand Island slightly, or Kearney, yeah. I-80, Upper Platte Valley Corridor appears to be the driest at this point. But nonetheless, comparing it to this about a year ago, we're in much, much better state financially, but uh, with precipitation. So that's the reason we see some of the things that we see right here. So at least drought isn't quite as bad as it was at this time. Compared to last year, I think the soil profile has a lot more moisture in it, at least for many areas. And uh, how do we deal with some of this uncertainty when we have uh, uncertainty with respect to the commodity prices? Maybe, it, maybe it's a wet spring, but it's going to be a really dry summer, whatever the case is. Well, one thing we can do when we're not certain about different things, the most classic example would be lower commodity prices, is take a look at um, adjusting the cash rent by either adjusting it higher or lower using what we call a flexible cash lease. You can use flexible cash leases based on actual performance or price for the crop yield, um, how much rain did the pasture get, or even the livestock, uh, what price did you sell the cap for? I'll be focusing on uh, one example looking at uh, adjusting the cash rent based on prices of the crop, and also looking at how do we adjust our grazing cash rent. So in our first example here, we have our initial expectation in the top hand, top third of the slide here. We're paying $220 an acre. We hope to raise 150 bushel. And from crop insurance, the 30-day planting time price average was 466 a bushel. And from that, um, something's going to happen. So in our first scenario, we have a case where the price of corn goes up. And on the right hand side, we have a case where the corn price goes down. And with accounting for these different factors or forces, we have two cases here where we adjust the cash rent up because we have a higher, a higher corn price, and we adjust the cash rent lower because we have a lower price. So you can see the breakout here on how the cash rents vary. We added it's based on the percent change here, okay, percent change down, percent change up percent change on what the actual harvest time price was. And uh, this is just giving us one idea that if you're struggling on setting a cash rent, this can be one simple way to adjust a cash rent to maybe make it a little bit more equitable given the circumstances that people are operating on. Another idea, if you're someone uh, let's say you're paying $325 or you're charging $325 per I'll cap here for the summer grazing season. And when you look at uh, the, say you looked at the feeder cattle futures prices here, when you knew how many calves you were going to put out on grass. And um, you get to the fall, instead of prices being at 260, they end up a little bit under that, about 7% lower. And under this case, we're going to discount the cow calf pair rental rate because we have a situation where the, per pair, the prices of the calves in the fall are not nearly as valuable as we had hoped for. Per so and this is just an example of changing the cash rents down slightly. And the other option is, okay, let's say the futures prices on feeder cattle go even higher than 260. Um, with that being said, Excuse me, these numbers should be, let's see here. These numbers need to be switched. The actual futures price, feeder cattle futures price was 278. Excuse me. So if the prices are higher than we had hoped for, under this case, we would adjust the cash rent higher. So we're going to add 2275 on because prices are, once again, these numbers should be transposed. My apologies. Uh, with adjusting these, 
Um, that being said, we're adding on a premium to the cash rent because we're in a situation where prices are better than we'd hoped for. And then the other slide here, we discounted the cash rent because things were not as good as what we had hoped for. So that's just one simple idea on how do we adjust our cash rents to account for some of these differences. Okay, with that, I'll go ahead and mute myself and Anastasia Meyer will get started. Okay, so I'm here to talk to you today primarily about, oh, you want to pro, go to the next slide, Jim, about communication this year. Um, communication is going to be a key for any successful leasing relationship with the tenant and the landlord. A lot of times, uh, Jim and I can both agree on this, the last person to know that one party is upset with the other party is the other one. So um, I am striving to decrease that and talk less at the coffee shop with your neighbors and more to the party directly. And so during the grows growing season, um, tenants consider reporting to the landlords regularly. This can be anything about, hey, we got a quarter of an inch this last week. Um, things are coming up good or, you know, we're really dry. Let them know because unless they live in that area, they don't know what's happening in the rain. Maybe they're not watching the weather for that, uh, but keep them informed. Let them know what the weeds are doing. Um, is there any insect pressure? Um, are you doing a crop rotation because you want to? I know some tenant and landlords have agreed on continuous corn and there's um, 30 fields with 30 years of continuous corn and they're getting some disease pressure there. Um, talk to them about that because if you want to switch it up, you're going to need to talk to them. Talk to them about your current crop prices, what the what they're doing, how much your inputs are costing. Um, you know, that misconception that farmers make a lot of money. Well, some years it's true. Some years they lose money. Um, communicate what your inputs, what the crop prices are with each other. Um, even if you have a cash lease, you need to talk to them. Crop shares, you're going to be in communication a lot more than what if you were doing a um, cash lease agreement, but regardless, you still need to be talking to your tenant more and the landowner more than just when you hand them a check and more than when you sign the um, agreement, if you have agreement. If, if they live far away, um, if they're one that's maybe not in the best health and they don't want to come out to the field, give them a call, um, send them a text message. That little action can go a really long way in building that relationship and building that communication aspect between a tenant and a landowner. Jim, you want to proceed to the next one? So some special considerations for tenants is both the landlord and tenant need to communicate effectively on the needs related to the leases. So we always like to say, Listen, listen first, don't assume anything, ask questions to understand. Um, because if you don't ask those questions, it's easy to assume. A lot of times for tenants, um, if your original landowner had passed away, they that landowner maybe didn't communicate with the family or whoever is now managing that farm, they didn't communicate maybe the fact that you're covering some costs that is typically a landowner expense, but the tenants are doing it. So they're having a reduced rate. A lot of times we see this in families. Um, you know, maybe the family is getting a little bit of a reduced rate and the other family doesn't understand. But if you ask the questions, maybe you find out that um, they are, maybe they're paying the taxes from mom and dad. Maybe um, they have paid for all of the liming or the conservation practices. Um, we don't know those things until unless we ask. And a lot of times tenants and 
landowners don't really communicate about the economics of things very well um, because we live in the Midwest. And so we were always taught not to talk about money. Well, in these situations, I do urge you to communicate what you're paying for um, because it's easy to assume that, you know, the other party isn't paying enough or it's never too much. Nobody ever thinks that you pay too much um, unless you're a tenant. So, Jim, you want to go on to the next one? So considerations for land owners or landlords during the growing season, consider going out to your tenant. Maybe um, you go out to the field, take them a lunch or just pop in, ask, you know, when you're planting my field, um, pop in, see, see how your field is looking. Um, is there some ditches that are happening? How, what is the state of your ground? You know, what's influencing your property in 2024? Um, if your tenant is not communicating regularly, just ask for a simple update. Um, express your expectations on weed control. Um, are they responsible for spraying in the dry lot, in the ditches? Are you? Um, is there other expectations that you want them to do on that ground that maybe isn't what a typical lease looks like, um, but you expect it from them. And therefore maybe you offer a reduced rate um, because you want it to look nice. So one example I'm thinking here is if you have a fence around your crop ground, cause it was always there. And um, if you want that to be upkept a little bit, maybe you ask your tenant to do it, but then offer a reduced rate. Um, if it's a cash lease, if it's um, a crop share, you guys can, can can negotiate maybe something else. But just whatever your expectations are, whether you are a landowner or a tenant, you need to communicate what those expectations are. Because um, without the communication is a lot of times when Jim and I will get called. So you can go on to the next one. So do you need to adjust your leases. Well, it depends. Crop share, we typically don't because the production risk is going to be both shared between both parties, the so landowners and the tenants. Um, as a share, you know you're paying your 40% in and therefore you're getting out your 40%. So if the crop year is bad or if prices go down, you're not losing any more than what the what your share is. Flexible leases, may not need adjusted depending on what your lease provisions are. Um, every flexible lease agreement is a little bit different. So, you know, it just kind of depends what yours is. In cash leases, will they need to be adjusted? Well, that depends. Um, what does your lease say? Do you have a verbal lease or do you have a written lease? What are your terms? When are you guys going to decide what the rental rate is going to be for that year? Um, a lot of times people wait until Jim publishes his um, lease or his real estate survey. Um, so we're getting a lot of calls on that, what to charge for leases. Um, or are you motivated to sell because of the high or low commodity prices? Right now, you know, we're seeing some lower commodity prices. And I really urge people that if you go up on the good years of high commodity prices, you need to be willing to come down on the lower commodity price years. Um, the argument is, yes, you have land um, taxes and they never go down. But if you're going up specifically because maybe those corn and soybean prices are, are high that year, when they drop down, you need to be willing to go down as well. Um, I like to tell people or remind people that is it better to get top dollar every single year and maybe you have different tenants or is it better to have one tenant that you have a good relationship with that maybe you're not getting top dollar every single year, but um, they treat the land well because they've had it for numerous years. Um, your desires might be different than another person's desires. So that's really something that um, I urge landowners to think about when they are thinking about adjusting their 
lease prices. Jim, you want to go to the next one? So adjusting leases due um, to rapid change in prices, it says increase in here, but increase or decrease, it has to be decided by both parties. If one party wants to and another party does not, if you cannot agree on it, you're pro it's probably not going to happen. So think about the gross crop revenue per acre. Um, and we have a couple math here later on in my next slide, actually. But depending on which area of Nebraska, it, we have these generalized figures of how much you should be getting on return for um, the gross revenue compared to your cash rental rate. For corn, we want to be closer to that 25% for soybeans, closer to that 35%. And those numbers will make sense in the next slide. Go ahead, Jim. So in this example, um, consider we have a center pivot irrigated cash rental rate at $350 an acre. And I kept the cash rental rates from last year to um, just kind of show you how the math works out. So this field has an APH of 240 bushels per acre, and we're gonna use a price of 475 a bushel at harvest. Um, so your gross revenue is going to be $1,140 per acre. So if you take 350 divided by the 1,140, if your cash rent is 350, your rent is going to be 30.7 of gross revenue. And like I said earlier, we want to be typically within that 25 to 35% range. So you're in that range. Um, if you want to decrease, you know, $300 would be at that closer to that 25, at that 26.3%. Um, last year, if we use this scenario, um, at three hundred and fifty dollars, five fifty corn would have been equal to that three hundred dollar cash rent. Now, um, so is there any questions regarding this specific example here? Um, go ahead and type it in, and we can come back to it. Jim, you want to go to the next one? So this next scenario is going to be dryland soybeans. So. We are going to say that the rent is $200 an acre, same as last year. Our APH is 45 bushels an acre, and I'm going to use a price of $11.25 at harvest. So your gross income is going to be $506 an acre. If you, if you take the rent divided by the gross income, you're looking at that 39.5% of gross income for paying rent. And like I said earlier, we want to be within that 25 to 35% range. So you might consider lowering, lowering this one. Um, if you want to use $175, that would be right at that 34.5%. Like I said earlier, if you're willing to go down, if the landowner is willing to go down when crop prices are bad, then the tenant needs to be willing to go up when crop prices are good and vice versa. You can go to the next one. So pasture leases, a lot of cattle are getting turned out to pasture right now. And if you do not have a pasture lease in writing or crop lease in writing, we really urge you to get those in writing. Um, for a pasture lease specifically, I want everyone to consider the big three disasters. So what happens if a fire happens? What happens if it's like last year and we have extreme drought or there's hail? Um, are you allowed to pull your cattle off and only pay for a portion of that cash rent? Well, it depends on what you have in the lease. And this is why we are really going to urge people to have that lease in writing. So landlords need to be clear about what their management expectations are. So who's controlling those cedars? Um, who's doing the fertilizing if it's a brome pasture and what the stocking rates are? Um, stocking rate and the rate, rental rate are something that definitely needs to be in the written lease, um, as well as if we have a big fire, can they pull out early? Um, 
and then prorate that rental amount that was agreed upon. Um, tenants, you need to report on what that pasture is looking like because unless they are driving by and live right there, there's a good chance that they don't know if maybe cedar control is getting a little bit out of control. Um, is Do you have some other problems going on? Um, I know in the Southeast area, Sericea lespedeza is becoming a real issue in some pastures. So let let the landowner know that these are your con um, issues that you are seeing. I typically say that unless a pasture needs major renovation, you know, the tenant can go out there and take control of those cedars. Um, they can go and spray the noxious weeds, maybe the thistles, sericea. Um, landowners, sometimes they pay for those chemicals for those noxious weeds because at the end of the day, if your tenant does not pay for that, you're going to be getting the nasty letter from the county and not the tenant. So, um, you know, those are some things that we see. Um, to control those expectations and make sure those expectations are being met. You want to go on to the next one? So as I have said before, we are really pushing that having a rich and lease is imperative for your farm. Gone are the days where a handshake is all that is needed. And a handshake is great until it's not. Um, so handshake lease agreements can be terminated at any time as long as it is before September 1 of the prior year. So um, I could evict Jim if he was my landowner, our la land, I was a landowner, he was a tenant. I could evict him today for next year's growing crop. Um, a lot of times we see this happen in early eviction notice if they are thinking about selling that land um, because they just want to make sure that they have it terminated well in advance that they know and that this is going to happen. Handshake agreements for farmland start on March 1. If you have a written agreement, you can have a different start date. You can have no termination um, date is noticed. It is just terminated at the end of the contract. One thing I will urge that if you have a written lease and you have a carryover clause, and what I, by carryover clause, I mean that every single year it's just going to renew until you decide not to, unless you have how termination is going to be given specifically in that contract, it reverts to a verbal lease. Even though you might have signed one two years ago, um, unless you specifically say how termination is going to be given and how much time it reverts to that um, verbal lease legally. For pasture leases, it is a little bit different because in Nebraska, pasture leases do not go for the entire year like cropland does. In pasture, it is from five months from when they put in the cattle to when they take the cattle out. So on the Eastern side, you know, maybe that's um, May 1, maybe that's May 15th, maybe it's June 1, depending on what part of the state you are in. But from five months from when the cattle get in to when they get out, once those cattle leave that pasture at the end of the five months in Nebraska, that that verbal lease for pasture is terminated then and there. So I don't have to give Jim a notice at all that I don't want him as a tenant in my pasture anymore. And we're really trying to emphasize that right now, that it, this is extremely different than the cropland leases. If you are looking for a good lease example, aglease101.org has these sample leases. They have crop shares for crop ground, they have pasture, they have cash, um, cash leases. You can go and either fill, fill them in or you can take these, they are, are a good starting point if you wanna take them to a lawyer and maybe have your own inclusions in, involved as well. Um, again, if you're starting this and you have never had a written lease before, if you like to hunt, if you like to fish, if you want to retain control of those or be able to enter your land for those purposes, you need to have them in your lease. Jim, go ahead and move on to the next one. 
So this is how, what the agleese101.org is going to look like when you type it into your browser. If you go and click the document library, it'll take you to the next slide. And on the right hand of the page, we have all the lease forms. So these are the fillable PDF forms that you can adjust to meet your needs for your landlord tenant relation. Um, I will say that these might get updated in the next year or two, um, but these are good starting points. If not, if you just want to use these, if there's stuff that you don't want in here, you can just go ahead and cross those off. Um, on the left side, we have lease publications, and some of these are kind of dated a little bit. I really like the rental agreements for farm buildings and livestock facilities, um, but you need to adjust that rate. These rates, as I always say, are good starting points. Um, you know, I think Jim was saying that you're updating some of these. Yeah, so there's some grant work going on right now to update the actual lease forms on this website. To my knowledge, the building rental rate survey found on the left column towards the bottom of the document library. If you look this up, Ryan Evans slipped the link into the chat pane for this meeting today. I would surmise that the farm building rental rate surveys, they think they were conducted, I don't remember the exact year, I think it was like 2012 or 13, mm -hmm. so you're almost... 10 plus years old, depending on what year it was, those rates would probably be at least 30% higher. An example, they give a rental rate for a concrete, uh, renting like a machine shed with a concrete floor with 14 foot sidewalls, pay so much per year, per month, per square foot. So they are a starting point. You can negotiate higher. Even in the last three years, the cost of buildings, steel, uh, some of the different tariffs that have been put in place are definitely going to influence the cost of products or uh, different items that are manufactured with steel or tin. So just be aware of that. But uh, yes, this is a great resource. If you don't like what you find here, you can always go find your own attorney and do that. And remember, if you have a written lease that's going to exceed one year, you need to get that lease notarized because that's a form of a contract. And any contract in the state of Nebraska that lasts longer than one year should be notarized. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Jim. Um, I will say that if if you're looking to rent your buildings out, this is about the only place that has an actual number to start at. Uh -huh. sure. At least, yeah, it's really hard to find any other numbers. Okay, yep. Jim, you want to go on to the next slide? So now we have this Ask the Expert panel, and Jim and I will kind of go back and forth and talk about these. Um, these are some commonly yeah. asked questions that we get. Take it away. I'll tell you what, I think we had two questions submitted. I'll take the first one, and you can take the second one, Anastasia. Okay. All right, so first question. You have a situation here, and we also, I've been keeping an eye, there's at least three or four questions that have been submitted um, in the chat pane, and we'll... Give Anastasia a minute to review those as we're going through this question here, and we'll divide those up as well. So we have a property, a grazing land property, and you want to include some conservation provisions into it. When I say you, I'm referring to the land. Say, for example, the landlord would like to see rotational grazing conducted on the property. Okay, um, That's going to require cross-fencing and different management practices related to that. Maybe you have to add some watering tanks across the property as well or something. Um, how do you approach this? First thing is what Anastasia highlighted, proper communication. You have to find two individuals that are actually interested in doing it. It's just not the landlord, but you have the tenant that's on the same page. There's gonna be additional time required to manage this property rotational grazing, you'll have to move the cattle periodically rather than just leaving them at one site and they can roam the property as they feel fit to do. Um, does it, other things, if you have to upgrade the infrastructure on the property, water tanks, fencing, there would probably be two of the most common ones. Who's gonna pay for this? How is it gonna be installed? Uh, weed control, do you have to manage the weeds differently? All these different things are things you have to talk about. I've always have felt that 
fencing materials is a landlord expense because if the tenant leaves the property, they're probably not going to take out a permanent barbed wire fence with that. Nonetheless, uh, these are all things you need to negotiate. And uh, if, as a landlord, if you have the equipment to install these new things, that's great. But if the tenant's the one doing that, you got to negotiate that in the cash rent. You're probably going to discount the cash rent for a period of time to account for the fact that you know, they invest their time, skills, talents, whatever, doing some of these different things. Anastasia, would you like to take this one? Sorry, I had to unmute myself. So if a tenant does not pay a landlord in accordance to the terms of the lease agreement, um, the amount or when it's due, does the lease continue until the termination date? Well, it depends. Um, it's a typical right answer. It depends. But it depends on the provisions in a lease for late payments. Do you give them a grace period written um, in there? You, uh, the landlords may have the grounds to evict or dismiss a tenant. Now, if stuff is already in the ground, um, first of all, we're going to suggest that you use an attorney to communicate with them if they just absolutely refuse to pay the rent. Um, but certain states do have the provisions that allows the landlord to demand rent within so many time, so many days. And then if that does not happen, then you can place a lien on the growing crop. So if, let's say you get half of your rent um, at the beginning of the year when the crops are put in and you get half at the end. Um, and I really like that scenario. But it, let's say you don't get your first half and maybe their operating note is already maxed out and they can't pay you. Um, you can actually have a lien on that crop that it will either you have to sign off on a check to in order from them to cash it at the co-op. Um, so if it's if you are not paid by whatever date you can actually have that lien placed on there. Um, if they are really uncooperative at um, paying for things, if they're ignoring your phone calls, ignoring your communication efforts completely, um, we recommend that you go to an attorney and to go aid you in that communication process. Um, you know, the legal advice, what to do, talk to your attorney for that. If, if you don't want to pay for an attorney right out and you just want to ask some questions, um, the rural response hotline is a great resource to ask the legal questions. Um, the call is free. You can talk to somebody and see what your options are here. But if it's a verbal lease, you can give them a termination date right then and there, um, terminate them. And then the next growing season, get a different tenant. Yeah, you almost have to weigh the difference. Anytime you get an attorney involved in court proceedings, it's going to cost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have a large property, obviously it'd probably be worth it. But if you have a smaller property, sometimes you're almost better off just to walk away from them. You know, you lose out on the cash rent, but is that cash rent going to be less than having to hire an attorney, go through the court proceedings? And even then, it's unknown if there's any money there. So that's where you consult an attorney figure out your best options. Most attorneys usually at least will answer the phone, run your question by them, and they can tell you, you know, if we're going to approach this, what is it going to cost or what are the things, how does it look? Yeah. So. And, you know, I don't know. I don't think the lean process is that difficult as well. Um, but to find out the exact ramifications of that contact role response for your attorney. All right. Oh, okay. yeah. Now we are to the question and answer. Um, let me take the first one and then I'll just go every other one if that's okay with you, Anastasia. Okay. So, so first question, I set my cash rent each August. I'm assuming they, for example, for 2024, they would have set their cash rent on uh, August of 23. And uh, with that cash rent being set almost six months beforehand or more, um, how do we adjust that cash rent? Since So since it's paid before the growing season, to use a flexible cash lease, lease method, 
does the renter make just one payment or do they make multiple payments? And the answer to that is, okay, if you do decide to do a flexible cash lease somehow, grazing land, crop land, doesn't matter. Typically, you ask for a portion of the cash rent up front, half or a third. Why? Well, what's the landlord have to pay at least twice over the upcoming growing season? Real estate taxes. Now, with that money, you are going to adjust that final cash rental rate either up or down. So uh, if you're doing installments, you'd probably have a second installment, say maybe either in the fall or the uh, around harvest or when the cattle are taken off the property. And that final payment, maybe the final half, would be paid um, at the time of settlement of the flex lease or thereabouts or before the first of the year or whatever we decide to do. All right, Anastasia, do you want to take the next one? Yep, I can answer this one. Um, so we had a question asking about why we go through these cash rent adjustments when the landlord doesn't have access to the prices per acre to know how much to adjust. Um, and this is when I really encourage that communication. Um, say... If you are the land owner, landlord, maybe you ask what their APH is. Um, technically, they don't have to give it to you. But if you explain to them like, hey, I know crop prices are going down. Um, I, you know, just say that you watch this webinar and maybe maybe you need to adjust some cash rent if it's still high. Um, I, they're going to be more than willing to work with you through these different scenarios on how to adjust the cash rent. But it's gonna take communication from both sides. And it might take the landlord starting that communication because you know, as a landlord, you can go through and um, you can go on the internet and see, you know, what the expected harvest prices are um, or what the expected market year prices are for the commodities that they're growing. And then if you have their APH, which is their 10 year yield history, you guys can go about figuring this out. But again, it's going to take that communication. Yeah. And when it comes to prices for crops or livestock, a lot of the time you can go on different websites. An example for livestock, many of the local auction sale barns have like a market report. So you can find prices there. You go on the futures websites. There's many, many, many different websites. You can find the current state of futures prices. And also the local co-ops or wherever you sell your grain through or market it through, many of them have websites as well where you can find prices. So uh, it's just not the tenants, the only one has disposable information at hand. You as a landlord can find many of these things as well. Okay, so next question here, it says, please talk about wind companies contacting landowners to set leases for windmills. Should renters be consulted? Is this even a good idea? Are there guidelines from UNL on uh, setting up lease arrangements for wind? You could maybe even say solar power. How does this affect the land value and rent? A lot of different things. So Carol, uh, Carol was an individual that asked this question. If I don't answer your question completely, contact Anastasia or I and we can walk you through it. Anytime you set up a long-term lease arrangement, whether it's renting your ground to someone for five or 10 years, um, subleasing a portion or all the property to establish a solar field or a wind turbine, keep in mind that even if the property gets sold, those terms of that lease move forward with it. So let's say you put a windmill out there, then five years from now you decide to sell it. Well, that windmill, those payments from that windmill, wind to energy generation site, that all goes with the property sale. So keep that in mind. Uh, anytime we have some, whether it's wind or solar or whatever, you gotta ask yourself, how does that influence the configuration of the field? Are they using just, you know, the one corner that is just in grass and it's only two, three acres, so you really don't do much with it? Do they wanna put it right in the middle of the field and it would obstruct the pivot? Uh, the tenant should be kept in the loop on this because it will be impacting their ability to farm the property. Ask them, what do they think? Um, solar panels, it seems like with those uh, additions to the property, those things can be removed. 
with wind turbines, just keep in mind that even if the wind turbine leases over and they come out and take the windmill down, the concrete below the ground, I've heard there's like, I don't know, 70, 100, 150 mm -hmm. yards of concrete. That will practically speaking, they'll never leave. So just be aware of that. So once that's poured, they'll probably stay there forever. Mm -hmm. So you got to keep in mind those type of things. Um, I don't have any exact guidelines on this. I will tell you, if you are considering this and you're serious about this, this is where you go in and hire an attorney to review the contract and get their opinion. I'm not an attorney. If you sign a 30-year lease for something like this, spend 500 bucks or even more than that, have mm -hmm. that attorney go through it. And keep in mind, just because someone gives you a contract doesn't mean there's any, there's any room for negotiation. It's a two-way street. Um, <laughs> I'll add to that too. Um, in my previous line of work, there was a lot of wind turbines going in and the people who signed right away, they didn't think about that, all that concrete. Um, and the people who signed later, they actually worked it into a lease that they would remove the concrete so many feet so that they could go back in and um, farm over where that turbine used to be. Um, so that might be something to think of. I mean, it, yes, they're going to have some drought issues, but at least it's not a big chunk of concrete that you have to drive around all the time. All right. Good mm -hmm. point. Um, the next question here is, I'm going to answer one first that was in the chat. Um, APH is average production history. So it is an average of your 10-year production history. So um, it's your corn average over the last 10 years is your soybeans average over the last 10 years. Um, okay, then moving on to our next question is, do does our lease farms on Ag Lease 101 um, include renting not only the farm buildings, but the house? The survey rates do have a house option on here. It's called rural housing. Um, it's the very last link on the right-hand side. Um, it breaks it out into one to 50 years old, um, how many bedrooms it has. But we just really urge you to remember that these rates are 12 years old, let's say. So they are going to be outdated. Um, if you have a house that you want to rent, you know, it might be a better option to call a real estate agent to see how much um, houses are going for rental houses um, rather than using this. But you know, I'll just tell you right now that I'm looking at it here. It, it varies drastically. It says a house from one to 50 years old um, ranges from $300 a month to $1,000 a month. So I think it's better off to call someone local and see what a house in your area is going to bring because, um, you know, a house on the outsides of Waverly is going to bring a lot more than a house near um let's just say Plymouth which is a tiny town so yep. those are all very good points I would have fully agree with that the uh housing market is kind of a weird thing when it comes to farm sites uh one of the big thing is the age of the home is this a hundred year old home that's been maintained is it a newer ranch style home that has decent heating and cooling abilities location's always a big thing mm -hmm. um you know, if you rent the house, do you get a two-car garage or a full-frame building to go with it? Um, housing is expensive. So even the smaller towns, it seems like the prices have slowly crept up since mm -hmm. about 2020. The, all the real estate markets have just a lot of different changes. So mm -hmm. those are all really good points. Ask around, look at the local newspaper, see what they're getting for cash rents. I have had more questions on dealing with tenants that do not mean a house, maintain a house, um, you know, being rough on the property and that. In the long run, what I've suggested to people, if you want to own the land, it's great, but then your headaches will increase as time passes on your out homes, machine sheds and that. Sometimes it makes more sense to survey off three or five acres and sell the home off to someone that you know it's actually going to maintain it. People never take as good as care of stuff if they own it or if they rent it versus uh, doing some of these kind of things, or actually owning it. 
And I will say to like have realistic expectations and communicate those expectations. Um, if you are a amazing yard keeper and you have this immaculate garden and landscaping every single year, uh, know that the tenant might not have those same standards. Um, so have some realistic expectations, um, you know, set yeah. on the yard because I feel like that's a lot of the questions I get to the angry people who I'll admit it I, I couldn't time my mowing right and well I reseeded my yard when I mowed so um and then Jim did you see that we have another question in the chat it was what are our thoughts on setting up a foundation with assets that include the land then the tenants pay uh the rent to the foundation and i guess my uh question to this is you know what is that foundation's purpose why a foundation um you know what are your goals yeah. are you yeah are you leaving it to like a religious foundation or the university of nebraska foundation there's probably taxation and estate planning uh, different considerations surrounding that that would probably be the biggest motivation on why someone would leave that land asset related assets mm -hmm. to a foundation and uh, depending on what that foundation says maybe the grounds can be managed by someone or something professionally maybe they just take the great cash rent so that's a probably a little bit more of an estate planning deal that you'd have to mesh out with the uh, uh, provider of the uh, or the individual that's in charge of the foundation mm -hmm. so with that Let's say uh, I've got a few more slides here. Um, once again, if we're, anybody would like to get their name up here, we always mention it twice. We always get a very nice group of people. So be sure to reach out to Anastasia or I if you'd like to sponsor one of these meetings. And uh, also on the topic of foundations, uh, to continue our annual outreach, we have a small foundation account with the University of Nebraska Foundation. Uh, if you'd like to make any financial donation or anything like that, it goes simply to helping conduct the survey. The cost of mailing of everything is getting more expensive. Send out a lot of surveys every year. And uh, finally, our next webinar we got coming up will be Monday, August 19th, 2024, right into the hardest summer. And uh, here are the topics that we have listed out. We're going to be taking a look at the final um, kind of the breakout here on uh, some of the different things related to the final report. Uh, communication, terminating and verbal lease will be right around the corner for this time of the year for that. And uh, also we'll have our list of upcoming land management workshops, which I think we'll probably start doing those in either late July or early August, all the way through September. So, all right. Bye. Um, when you guys close out, you'll get a brief little survey. Um, if you have any topics that you want us to cover, go ahead and type those out. Um, once you close out, that should pop up. And Jim and I really appreciate those comments and those ideas. Thank you. Right. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.